Welcome to Mormon Kabbalah 101. My name is David Fairman. I am the first elder of the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. I have been a minister for the past nearly four years, and I have been teaching Mormon Kabbalah for about a year and a half now. And this week we're going to be talking about Pardes and the Orchard of Kabbalah. I'd like to start off with an opening prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before thee this day and come to thee in humility, asking for thy grace and thy blessings, asking for thy knowledge and thy wisdom that we may gain understanding through your mercy and through your justice. We ask that as we partake of this class, we will taste the fruits of the Spirit. We will speak spirit to spirit. We will learn from one another. We will grow closer to thee. And through this, we ask that thy light shine from us. Help us to heal the world. Help us to bring heaven to the earth. We ask thee for wisdom and the knowledge to know what to do with it, knowledge and the wisdom to know what to do with it. We ask thee to open our eyes. Help us to grow, that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And these things we pray, in the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen. We're going to start off with the eighth article of faith. We believe the word of God recorded in the Holy Bible. We also believe the Word of God recorded in the Book of Mormon and in other good books. When we talk about Mormon Kabbalah, really any Latter-day Saint of any denomination can study Mormon Kabbalah. I do want to emphasize that every denomination has their own set of scriptures. Some may merely have a Bible and a Book of Mormon. Some may add a version of the Doctrine and Covenants. Some have other books. So what, what is scripture? For the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, we have a very open canon. While the scriptures universally accepted by all Latter-day Saints or Mormon denominations include the Bible, which would be the Old Testament and New Testament, and the Book of Mormon, we went back and said, what were the scriptures according to the vote of the saints in the original Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Joseph Smith's time? And at that time, they had the Bible, which was the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Apocrypha. They had the Book of Mormon. They had the 1844 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. And really, that was it. So because of that, we include the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants. We accept the Book of the Law of the Lord. We voted on this in conference in April of 2019. Now, we also voted on a couple other books. One is the Book of Enoch. We chose to vote on this book because it was accepted as Scripture by the authors of the New Testament. Is it authentic? It's at least as authentic as the book of Daniel and the Apocrypha and, and several other scriptures, but it was preserved by the Lord through the Ethiopian church, and so we have a version of it in our canon. In addition, I took a collection of various writings from Joseph Smith and other members of the original Restoration Church before it was organized. Some of, some of them were written after, but it's all events before it was organized, and compile what's called the Book of Avar. Avar is Hebrew for past. And that tells the story that ties all of us together as Latter-day Saints. From before Joseph Smith was born, the visions that his mother and father had, all the way up until the printing of the Book of Mormon. In addition, we also have a book of scripture called the Book of Remembrance. The first revelation that I was inspired to write down and present is the opening first chapter of this book, the second two are revelations that I received back when I was in high school in the 80s. The rest of that book is a series of revelations that I received in January of 2016. We also voted to include a number of other dreams, visions, and revelations that I had. And those are separated out into two separate things because they're going to be compiled differently in the future. But currently, you can buy an edition of, of the Book of Remembrance with these other dreams, visions, and revelations. We say these are canon, what does that mean, and why were other things excluded? It should be remembered that additional scripture will always be forthcoming. There will always be more revelations to receive. We were instructed, as a fellowship, to put together a collection of all the scriptures of the Latter-day Saint movement in a way that's not binding to us. Why? Because the true scriptures, and we'll get into this in a minute, are written in our hearts. So when it comes to our bylaws as an organization, really the only thing that's in there that we need to say we believe is the Bible and the Book of Mormon. All of the other scriptures that are there are used for things that we do. We need 
a version of the Doctrine and Covenants, which we're currently putting together. It's called The Doctrines of the Saints. And that book basically tells us how to run the organization. It will include revelations from Joseph Smith and many other prophets and apostles that came after him, including myself, Christine Farriman, my wife, and a variety of other apostles and prophets within the fellowship. The Book of Avar, we are a unity movement. So we, of course, are going to have this book in there because that's our shared history. It's what we have in common. The Book of the Law of the Lord also tells us, again, the law. It's a book that helps us reconnect to the Lord as it came from the brass plates. And the Book of Enoch, again, if we have the Bible and we have the Apocrypha, because that's what the original church voted on, why wouldn't we add the Book of Enoch in addition to this, as it is a witness of Christ, number one. And number two, it does tie the churches together. It was used in the Church of the Apostles in Jesus' time, and so it answers and fills in some of the blanks that are missing in their writings. With that, the article of faith that I read says, and other good books. What are these other good books? It's not just the scriptures that are forthcoming. It's also any pseudepigraphal work or any other revelation that comes from the wider range of this movement. So when we say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we don't mean a denomination. We don't mean the Strangites. We don't mean Brigham Young's group out in Utah. What we mean is the church is in the people, the body of Christ. Which body of Christ? The Latter-day Saints. Those that have come to Christ through this, the restored covenant. So we have all these different scriptures. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, what's most important is the scripture that's written in your heart. Because when we open up the Bible, anybody can open up the Bible, a Christian, a, a Jew, a Muslim, and when we open it up, we all see something different. And when an atheist opens it up, that atheist will see something different. Well, what's written in our hearts? The atheist doesn't have God written in their heart. So they can't see the plain and precious things. It won't be revealed to them. The Jew, the Christian, the Muslim, we are of Abraham. If we have that connection with the Lord, then we have the true prayer written in our hearts. And so therefore the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, will reveal to us what is meant by the words. How does he reveal that? That's really the topic of discussion today. We're going to go over the four partis. These four partis are the different levels of looking at the scriptures. It's how the scripture in our heart and the scriptures that are written down on the paper and what's known as the oral Torah, which is when we extrapolate on the word, it's how we understand what God wants us to know from it. And there are four. There's the shot, Ramez, Darash, and Sot. A shot means surface. It's the literal meaning. You're just skimming the surface of the scriptures. What does it say? What does that literally mean? Remez, that's hints, that's symbolic meaning. What does what you're reading represent? Derash is the concept. You're getting into that deeper wisdom of God. And sought is the mystery. That's the revelation that God gives us. If you've ever been reading a scripture and all of a sudden something just clicks with you, it just, just clicks. That's so. So let's, let's dive into these. Let's, let's talk about these concepts. I'm going to start off by reading a translation that I did of Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, Elohim created the earth and the heavens. Over the surface of the abyss was darkness, waste, and formlessness. She became the earth. The spirit of Elohim hovered over the surfaces of the waters. So the first rung is the plain or contextual meaning of the text. Bashat it's Hebrew. It means simple. Bashat is the first stone in the foundation of scriptural understanding. So in this verse that I just read, these, these two verses, we can all see very clearly and understand with simplicity that there was a beginning to this world. It started somewhere. And we know by reading this, or at least we understand or comprehend, that Elohim, which is a name for God, had a hand somehow in that creation. So he took what was there, he took the darkness, the waste, and the formlessness, and she became the earth. Now we can take this, and this plain, simple view of it, and in context, we can now understand the rest of that first chapter. In addition to that, we can also look back and study who were the people that wrote this, who were the Hebrews, who were the Israelites, who were the Jews, who were the people that translated this into English. Look at it from those cultural perspectives. So you can see it as a point in history, 
You can see it through its cultural relevance and gain all of these perspectives that are tied to this world. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is the first rung of the ladder. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind, though, when we're using this approach is that authors in the scriptures are not always literal in what they say. So, for example, if an inanimate object is used to describe the person, a place, or something, if a donkey, for example, begins to talk, all of these things, or inanimate objects, are brought to life. These things are likely figurative, and that's when we've got to get into the culture. We've got to see what would the original readers think this meant. The same is true of figurative statements. That helps us dig in and look a little bit deeper. One thing to keep in mind is that God gave us this to help us find him, to find spirituality, not as a history book or a science manual. So when we're looking at this on the surface, we don't want to become too fundamentalist. We don't want to get too literal with this. I've talked to people who seem to have this idea that, well, Genesis says the earth was created in seven days. So either God is right or science is right. Well, no, look at it culturally. When it says seven days, what is culturally, what does that mean? If the sun and the moon and the stars hadn't been created, how did you even have the first couple of days anyway? When you're skimming over the surface, you want to make sure that you are looking at it in perspective. Don't just grab what you want and change the meaning into what you want it to say. But the fact that we have to go deeper isn't the problem. That takes us right into Ramez. This is Hebrew for hints, and it follows after the shot with the allegories. We start looking at the deeper meaning in the text by looking at the symbols. We look at it from a different angle. So let's take that quote from Genesis and let's read it again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It's translated differently. Let me read it again. In the beginning, the unnamed created Elohim and the heavens and the earth. Over the surface of the abyss was darkness, waste, and formlessness. She became the earth. The spirit of Elohim hovered over the surfaces of the waters. Now, I've just read that three different ways. Did any of these really change what it means on the surface? We know that there's a God. We know that these things were created by that God. But does it offer us another way of looking at it? Absolutely. In one, God moves, and the other, Elohim, hovers. In one, the earth is female, and the other, genderless. Both of these are correct. They're just different ways of looking at and translating the same text. What are the symbolisms here? Knowing that the earth is female, what does that lean towards? What, is it, what does it represent? What does it make you think? What, what's, what's being hinted at here? In addition to that, all of these words have a variety of different meanings. Like I showed you, there's different ways to translate this. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? The Spirit will be your guide. The point of Ramez isn't to translate the scriptures in a way that justifies what you want it to say. The point is to find several different views and allow the Spirit to teach you what God wants you to know. So let's move on to the third one here, Darash, Hebrew for concept. It can also be pronounced Midrash. If you're familiar with Jewish text, you'll know what the Talmud and the Midrash are. In Darash, we apply both Hashat and Ramez. We can take different verses and put them together to create, if you will, a new scripture with a deeper meaning. I'm going to give you an example here. I'm going to take several different scriptures talking about unconditional love, and I'm going to put them all together. I'm going to take John 15, 13, Matthew 26, 24 through 25, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and Doctrine and Covenants 93C from the Community of Christ edition and 9320 from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints edition, the Utah Church. Listen how all these flow together. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
and all those who are begotten through me are partakers of the glory of the same, and are the church of the firstborn. All of these are different scriptures written in different times and from different perspectives. But notice how they all flow together. Why? Because they all came from the same God. They're all teaching the same message. And by taking all these different passages about love, we can reach in and get that deeper meaning. In this example, we take some verses talking about Jesus' sacrifice, picking up our crosses, following him, both very difficult sounding tasks. We add his teaching that through him our burdens will be light. In the end, it reminds us of why we're doing this, that we're going to be with him, partaking in his glory. And we learn a greater truth. We used the rash to put these together and find a deeper meaning, a deeper truth. And we can do this, well, really, we do it all the time. Whenever you see someone reading a scripture and then comparing it to another scripture, that's literally what we just did here. Well, Jesus said this. Well, he also said this. Well, they're not contradictory. How do they flow together? How do they tie together? And if they do seem contradictory, how do you unify them? How do you put them back together? Now, all of this really goes to the next level when we get to the fourth, sod. This is a Hebrew word meaning hidden. It is the secret or mystical meaning of the text. When we say secret and mystical, it sounds all mysterious. But in reality, it's that deeper meaning that you don't get unless you have the Holy Spirit. Look, for example, of when Jesus is teaching his followers that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. All these people basically ran away, right? They came to him for food, and he's offering them spiritual enlightenment. Because they were looking for worldly food, they didn't understand. They thought he was talking about cannibalism. Of course they're going to run away. But those of us who have the word, the true scripture written on our hearts, we see the spiritual message. We understand what it means. This is referring to us accepting him, accepting his grace, and then moving our lives forward to do his works. It's speaking of that sacrament of communion that he taught to his disciples at the Last Supper. The bread is a symbol of the spring harvest, the grapes, autumn. This is the alpha and omega of the harvest season. In Exodus 25, 30, God commands us that the bread of the presence be placed upon the table before me always. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said? I am with you always, Matthew 28, 20. Really, I could give a whole sermon about the bread and the wine being the flesh and blood of Christ, symbolically. But those that are just looking to be fed physically, they're not going to get it. They don't understand the mystery. That's what makes it a mystery. It's not that it's complicated. It's not that it's hard. Their eyes are just closed. They refuse to see. It really is a ladder. It grabs all of the other parts of the partish and ties them all together. And by the way, I should add that partish means orchard. So when we think about the tree of life and Lehi's dream, it's the word of God. Well, the word of God is Christ. That's what the fruit is. But the scriptures are also that tree of life. When we reach up and grab an apple from the partish, that's the scriptures. That's God speaking to us through the scriptures. Sod is also revelation and inspiration. Revelation is the voice of the Lord coming to speak to us. Angels coming and visiting us, directly teaching us, just as we read Joseph Smith Jr. enjoyed in the book of Avar. Inspiration is that burning of the bosom, that spirit guiding us, just as, again, in the book of Avar, we read Oliver Cowdery felt at Avar 17. These gifts, these are gifts of the spirit, and they can be ours if we seek them, if we seek truth and the blessings of God. We can't just seek spiritual gifts because we want them, we seek them because we're trying to deepen our relationship with God. We're trying to find that deeper truth. If we ask, the scriptures tell us we will receive. So what does all this have to do with Kabbalah? Let's talk about the orchard. Luke 17, 20 through 21 says, The kingdom of God will not come by looking for it. Don't tell people to look here or to look there. Indeed, the kingdom of God is inside you. What's the church? Is it a building? When no one's there and the building's empty, is it still a church? Is it the organization people belong to? If everyone left, is there a church? Is it the ideology? When ideas change, is the church destroyed? The church is us. The church is the people. The kingdom of God isn't the building that we go to. It's not a book that we crack open and study. It's the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. 
And that is what Kabbalah is all about. Turning it inward, finding God inside of us so that we can cleanse our desires. And as we cleanse our Kli, Hebrew for vessel, God's light will pour from us to heal the world. So in Mormon Kabbalah, we use the Pardes, the orchard, for the internal and eternal progression. It's easy to look at this and say that Saud is the true Kabbalistic approach. But that would actually be inaccurate, because how can we have Saud if we don't climb the ladder, if we don't have all four together? So to have the true Kabbalistic approach, we must view the scriptures combining all of the Pardish. And then we take that message and we put it inside ourselves. We pull it inward. Everything works from the inside out. So if we don't put the scriptures inside us, if we don't have them written on our heart, they cannot come out of us. As I said, the scriptures were not written to teach us history. They were written and shared with us to bring us closer to God. The men and women that wrote the scriptures took something spiritual and put it down into a human language. It's in a code. And the only way to interpret that code is to join them where they were when they wrote them. And that is in the presence of God, in the spirit of God. So with that in mind, Kabbalah teaches us when we're reading the scriptures, we are everyone in that story. We are Moses. We are the Pharaoh. We are Peter the saint and Simon the magician. We are Moroni and we are the Lamanites trying to find and kill him. Think about that. Does it make sense? A lot of times we look at the scriptures and we just skim the surface and we say, oh, this is how this person did it. What a great moral story. But turn it inward. Aren't you Nephi? Weren't you born of goodly parents? Weren't you taught to read and write? Aren't you Laman and Lemuel that sometimes question authority? The question is, as we move up, are we developing the Laman and Lemuel attributes or are we rising from Nephi to Jacob to King Benjamin to Messiah to Alma? Are we cleansing our desires or is wickedness breeding and festering inside of us? O ye that are pure of heart, lift up your heads and receive the pleasing word of God and feast upon his love, for ye may, if your minds are firm, forever. That's Jacob 2.50 in the RAV, 3.2 in the OPV. As we are in the orchard, use the wisdom that God grants us to see the divine nature and the symbols of the dynamic process in the order of God. Look at the creation through the eyes of Kabbalah. Study my word which hath gone forth among the children of men, and also study my word which shall come forth among the children of men or that which ye are translating, yea, until ye have attained all which I shall grant unto the children of men in this generation, and then shall all things be added thereunto. Avar 19, 38-40 Perspective God meets us where we are. How can God meet us where we are if there is only one meaning for God's word, and we're not ready to hear it yet? Well, God is all-knowing, so he has found a better way. This is why we have the Pardish. That's how the scriptures can be so vast in their wisdom. That's why anyone truly seeking will find what they're looking for. All the scripture is alive in that it speaks to us exactly where we are. Anyone can read a portion of the text and gain some sort of wisdom and insight, even if that is rejected by others. We all shape the scriptures by our various perspectives. And if we are truly wise, our perspectives are then further shaped by the scriptures. One piece of advice I'll give you when reading the scriptures, and this is pretty key as far as trying to figure out what things mean. All of the law and the prophet will rest on two things, and these are the two key things to Kabbalah as well. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said that these were the two great commandments. They are what all the law and the prophet rest upon. If you're reading a scripture and you think about it long and hard, and you cannot see anything in that that helps you to love God and love your neighbor, your perspective isn't there yet. That scripture is not for you. God is not speaking to you in it yet. Set it aside and move on. If God does tell you how to love him and how to love your neighbor to a greater degree, then that is what he wants you to know. That is where you are at that moment. God meets us where we are. That's how we know that we're meeting him. In Kabbalah, it said that the Torah has 70 faces, which is to say that there are 70 ways of looking at each of the four parties. What does that mean? Jesus said that you should forgive someone seven times 70. 70 is a way of saying a lot. So many that you really just aren't going to run out. 
But how can this be? Why didn't God just give us exactly what we need to know? Why didn't he tell the authors how to write down exactly what he wanted to say? If we take every word in the scriptures, then we take every sentence, and then every verse, and then every paragraph, and then every chapter, and then every book, and then every collection of books, and then every grouping of words, and then combine them, every combination of grouping every passage together to come to new conclusions, again, this is the part of Darash, and any other way we can think of to study scripture and multiply these by four, and then again by 70, I don't know if we've reached infinity at this point, but that is a lot of perspectives. And really, that's the point. The point is that the scriptures can speak to all of us. They can meet us where we are. We just have to listen, and we have to pay attention. This is a class on Kabbalah, beginner class on Kabbalah. Obviously, this week we're looking at how to read the scriptures in the light of Kabbalah. So what is Kabbalah? If you ask 10 people, you're likely to receive 10 answers. But the one similarity you should find among all of them is, it is there to teach us a deeper truth to life. And as we find that truth, bring us closer to God. In the Zohar, there's a story. The sages taught, four enter the orchard, and they are as follows. Ben Azai and Ben Zoma, Ahir, and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva says unto them, when you reach the pure marble stones, do not say, Water, water, because it is stated, He who speaks falsehood shall not be established before my eyes. Ben Azayag, he glimpses and dies. With regard to him, the verse states, Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his pious ones. Ben Zoma glimpsed at the divine presence and was harmed. And with regard to him, the verse states, Have you found honey? Eat as much as sufficient for you, lest you become full of it and vomit it. I hear chop down the shoots. Rabbi Akiva came out safely. Does this mean that we, as we get closer to God, and we study Kabbalah, and we study the scriptures, that we're going to meet the fate of one of these four men? What if we actually meet God? What if we receive the second comforter? No. Remember, in Kabbalah, what did I just tell you? We're everyone, and everyone is us. The fate of all four men is our fate, or in other words, our desires. When we meet God, we will die. Does that mean that we're going to physically die? Not necessarily. This is to say that we will no longer be the person that we once were. We will be changed. We'll be born again. Does that sound more familiar? Our wicked desires will be purged from us. Will we go mad? Will we go crazy? No, again, our perception will change. People who aren't born again, who don't have that perception, they're not going to understand. They haven't experienced it. Take a look at the example of Galileo. He said the sun is the center of our solar system and not the earth. Look what happened to him. People thought he was nuts. They locked him up. In fact, the Catholic Church just recently apologized. This is exactly what will happen with us. Because we change our perceptions, we change who we are. And the traditions of men will see us as heretics. And that's exactly what it says happened to the second man. We will abandon the authority of men for the authority of God, but we, our true selves, will walk away unharmed. And that is to say that we've been washed clean. All the things that weren't really us are gone. The old us is dead. We're seen as mad, crazy, because we don't see things from a worldly perspective. We'll seem to be chopping down the shoots, but in reality, we've actually come out unharmed. We've come out better. We've come out clean. So taking a closer look at all this, Matthew 5, 3 states, Happy are the poor in spirit, for in them is the kingdom of heaven. The most interesting perspective to come out of Kabbalah, in my opinion, is the idea that heaven isn't some faraway place. It's not something to look forward to. It's not an eventuality. It's not coming. It's already here. It's something real right now. We just have to open our eyes to see it. And I say this because Kabbalah is about perception. Everything we talked about today was not which scripture is right and which scripture is wrong. It's about how we perceive what we consider scriptures. The seventh principle of Kabbalah is change perception, change reality. Why? What does that mean? It means that heaven is all around us. Heaven is in us if we but see it. So how then do we find heaven? I recommend we start by walking around in the orchard. That's our class today, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.